G'day everyone, I miss being with you all and I look forward to when we can re- reunite again. Uh, to begin, I want to read Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 25. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Let's pray together. Our Father, we want to praise you. We want to lift you up as the almighty God, the one who rules and reigns over all things. You are exalted, God. We lift you up and exalt you. We praise you for your control, your sovereignty. And we praise you for your goodness to us in so many ways, God. We thank you for how you have saved us. We thank you for how we can be reminded of this in your word. And we thank you even for this season that reminds us of your control and that you are working and that you work in all things. We pray that we would remember this, God, in this season, that you work in all things for the good of those who love you. And we pray as well, God, for us as your people that you would keep us Together, keep us near to you at this time. Help us to not forsake meeting together and encouraging each other, even though it will be in different ways. And we pray, God, that you would guard us, particularly at this time, from idleness and guard us from Satan, how he will work to rip apart your church while we are apart in many ways. We just pray that you would keep us, God, in this season and in this test and as we are apart, and that you would protect us, all for your glory. Amen. Why are you doing this, God? Why did you let them die? Why do they suffer? Why don't you stop this? Why? Why? Have you ever felt that? Or thought like this? Maybe you are flooded right now with questions of why. Many people in the world ask this as well. They wonder how a good God could let suffering happen. And I have felt felt this and thought this in my life as well, as I have lost loved ones, as I have seen people close to me go through deep pain and hurt. We will always face suffering in this world. And we are in a heightened time right now where many will suffer physically, financially, mentally, and socially. As Christians, how do we make sense of suffering? How do we make sense of what is going on at the moment? Well, we must realize at the outset that this, everything, and this is through God. Romans eleven thirty six says, From him, through him, and to him are all things. This changes everything and how we understand what is going on. We must realize that everything we face is not beyond God's control. All things are through him. God says in Isaiah 45 verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Suffering reminds us 
of God's control in all things. Nothing is outside his rule and reign. And if this is the case, then we need to ask, what is God doing in suffering? This is why we ask those why questions. To us, it doesn't make sense how a good and loving God could do any of this. But the Bible shows us some big things that God is wanting to do in difficult times. And when we see them, it helps us cope in suffering and know what God wants to come from it as well. It's like that painting, which looks a bit funny up close, but when you stand back, you see all those strokes blend in to make a beautiful landscape. Or it's like as I do, when you get stuck behind that car that is going so slow and you're wondering why, and then a little bit later you see the dog dart out in front of that car. When we face the fires of suffering, we are surrounded by flames and smoke and we can get lost in it. And our thoughts can be clouded by the little details. But what we need to do is take a step back. We need to see the bigger picture. We need to get a bird's eye view of the suffering and what is going on. We need a 2020 vision of suffering. And that's what I want to do for us today. I want to show you the big purposes of God in suffering all throughout God's word. I want to lay down these foundations to ready us for a season that we will suffer in. And I want to lay down these foundations so that we will have these pillars of truth to come back to and steady us in the storms of suffering that we will face in all our life. We need a right perspective on suffering so that we will live in a right way through it and so that we will know how to make sense of it. So what is God saying to us in this time? What is God's purpose in times of suffering? Well, firstly, suffering reminds us of the damage of sin. The beginning of the Bible makes it clear that suffering is a, is a result of original sin. Back in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, they fall into sin, they rebel, rebel against God, and immediately God shows that the consequences for this are death, that the consequences are enmity and hostility between humanity and Satan. He shows the consequences are pain and suffering and a corrupted creation with thorns, disasters, and sickness. Romans 8, 20-22, which we read before, tells us the same thing. It says, Creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Creation is groaning because it is in bondage to decay. Sickness, viruses, diseases, suffering, rot, mold, thorns, death are all part of this bondage to decay. And all of this has come because of humanity's rebellion against God and his ways. Suffering shows the damage of sin and all that it has brought. And sin has caused all of these things, not God. Therefore, suffering, it should be a reminder for us to long to be free of sin. It should cause us to hope in Christ who can free us from all its effects, damages, and consequences. How horrid is sin and what it has brought? It's devastating. The horrors of disease, disasters, and death show it. And also, 
when suffering shows the damage of sin, it is a reminder to live pure lives. It should remind us to not mess with sin, but steer clear of it, for it is damaging. Do whatever it takes to rid yourself of it. Don't play games with something that is so deadly. The sufferings that we face, they should make us long to be free from sin and all its effects. Secondly, what is God's purpose in times of suffering? Well, suffering is a joyful experience that grows us. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. And Romans chapter 5 verse 3 says, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who he has given us. To suffer is pure joy, What a mindset. It's pure joy that I suffer this hardship, that we suffer hardship, Paul is saying. Why? Because suffering grows us. We don't grow when life is easy. We grow when life is tough. The muscles in our body grow when they face difficulty, when they are pushed And we know this is the same for our lives. We grow and draw closer to God when we face something hard. So we need to see suffering as a great blessing. God wants us to grow. He wants to mature his children. So let him do it. Don't waste this season. Use it to grow. Let God grow you. Grow in righteousness and character and in your deep founded hope in God. For the Christian, suffering is a joyful experience. So ask yourself do you grumble when you suffer or do you consider it pure joy and a blessing? Suffering is for our good. And our next point shows this. Even more. Thirdly, suffering is God's good discipline to us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, The Lord disciplines those he loves, he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And then later, verses 10 and 11 say, Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It is not easy to discipline. It's not easy to discipline my daughters. It isn't nice for them or me in the moment. But oh, how it is for their good. Imagine if I didn't say no and discipline when one of my daughters wants to go and touch that fireplace again and again while it is burning hot. And we need to realize that God knows what is good for us and he wants this. It may not feel like it in the moment, but he disciplines you for your good. And here in Hebrews chapter 12, we see that God's discipline is to bring about holiness in our lives, righteousness and peace in us. This is what we need. But as well, another passage shows us that suffering is God's good discipline on us. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29 to 32. And here we see an example of God's mercy to people in suffering. 
God brought sickness and even death to those in the Corinthian church who were doing communion in a wrong way. And this was God's mercy on them. Because verse 32 says, God disciplined them so that they wouldn't be condemned. So we need to learn to love the good this discipline that God gives us in our suffering. Fourthly, what is God's purpose in times of suffering? Well, suffering can also be God's judgment on people. We must be sure to say that this isn't always the case. It isn't always like this. In John chapter 9, the disciples, they see a blind man and they ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? But Jesus responds and he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. So we see that sickness or suffering, they're not always a result of a sin. But sometimes in the Bible, we see that they can be. In Acts chapter 12, Herod addresses the people and they shout at him. And they say this to Herod, this is the voice of a God, not a man. But then in verse 23, it says, Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. And God did this with others too in the Bible. There are countless examples throughout the Bible, like Ananias and Sapphira, who died for lying to God. God at times may bring physical suffering to those who sin as an act of judgment on them. Don't brush off God's judgment that may be coming on you or others in suffering. But we must also remember that not all physical suffering happens because of a direct result of a sin. Number five, what is God's purpose in times of suffering well, suffering is a warning to us all to repent. In Luke 13, 1 to 5, we read this. Now, there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you too repent, you too will all perish. God's message to us in suffering is clear and simple. As diseases happen as disasters happen in our world, God is shouting at us, repent, repent, turn from your wicked ways, hate sin, be broken and confess your rebellion to God, desperately seek God's forgiveness and plead for the mercy that can come through Jesus Christ or you will perish. And once you have repented, Call others to repent. Use this season to warn people. Warn them of the greater suffering and the judgment that is to come that is far worse than the deadliest disease in this world. Far worse than what the deadliest disease could ever do to us. Warn them of God's eternal Anger in hell, that will come against them for every sin that they commit. And give them hope. The hope of forgiveness that can be found in Christ. God has given you an opportunity. He's given you an opportunity in this season of suffering. Don't waste it. Share of Christ and his salvation. Share of these things that can come to those who repent 
and believe in Christ. Six, we also see in the Bible that suffering causes us to rely upon God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Paul says to the church there, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even to life. Indeed, our hearts, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul suffered so many hardships, but for him, he saw that their purpose was to cause him to rely on God. And oh, how we need this. We need whatever it will take in our life to cause us to rely on God. We are bent towards relying on ourselves. We think everything is in in our hands. And what a wake-up call we have received recently. Life is not under our control, but in God's. Our lives are like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes, as James 4 says. And and so James, in chapter 4, tells us to not be proud planners. He says, you who say that today or tomorrow you will do this or that, you need to realize that you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Instead, you need to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And don't just say this, but deep down in your heart, acknowledge that you utterly rely on God. Acknowledge that you can do nothing without God allowing it. And realize that you are in His hands. Stop trusting self and trust His control. May this season where we feel so uncertain... We are totally unsure of what tomorrow holds. May it teach us to rely on God. Only He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Only He holds the future in His hands. Only He is faithful. Only He has the power over life and death. Only He can save your soul, and only He can be trusted. So trust Him. When all around you is failing, may you grow in your reliance upon God through all your trials. You need to grow in this. We all do. And God can give you this at this time. And as well, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to 7 also shows that trials and suffering, they will prove whether our faith is genuine. They will prove whether we are relying on God. The sufferings you face should cause you to rely more on God. And if they don't, you will be shown to be a phony. So let the trials that you face grow your faith and prove your faith to be genuine. Number seven, we see as well in the Bible, what are, what are God's purposes in these times of suffering, well, suffering reminds us of our greater hope. As we suffer in this life, it should remind us of the hope that we have as Christians. It reminds us of the new heavens and the new earth where suffering will be completely gone. We can face great hardship in this life. But we do not lose heart, for we have a greater hope in this life. 2 Corinthians, again, chapter 4, verse 16 to 18 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, 
not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The trouble that we now face, the troubles that we go through, they are preparing an eternal glory that far outweighs any sort of suffering and trouble that we will face. We have a future hope as Christians. We will be given resurrected bodies forever to be with God in the new heavens and in the new earth. But how? How can we have this future hope? What has made this possible? Well, we must remember that we will not eternally suffer what we truly deserve because Christ has suffered for us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Christ suffered so that we wouldn't have to. He suffered so that we could enjoy the forgiveness of sin and have a future hope. And so in our present sufferings, remember that they are nothing in comparison to what we should have faced. Nothing compared to the condemnation that we should have faced, but that Christ faced for us. And remember as well that Christ died to also completely do away with suffering and all of it. Romans chapter 8, verse 22 to 24 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. There will be groans across the world as we face suffering in this season. There should be groaning in us as we go through suffering. But for the Christian, they are waiting eagerly for adoption and redemption. We are waiting to be liberated from this bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. This week, our family had a bit of sickness and I had uh, gastro. And at one point, I felt like I was going to pass out and die. Sickness is not a nice thing. But what I had was nothing compared to what is out there, compared to what some people have to face, compared to the horrid pain that some people go through every single day. But what a glorious thing to think of our resurrected bodies with all sickness and suffering gone. What a hope we have. So let this season remind you of the greater hope that we have These sufferings and these troubles that we face are momentary. And let the knowledge of our future hope free you for God's service. Because you can know that your hope, it is not now. It is not having it all in this life. It's not being free from sickness and disease. That is not your hope. You have a hope that is to come. And so be willing to show costly love to others, to shine the love of Christ that you have received from him. Love your neighbors. And yes, be careful not to spread sickness, but also be willing to help people. Though you may get sick, do the shopping for the vulnerable that you may know so that they are not put at risk. Sit by the sick at their deathbed and love the souls of many who need us at this time. Be willing to love in ways that will cost you. Remembering the price that Christ paid to love you and to save you. 
and be willing to love and help others in risky ways. Because Romans 8 says, Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And finally, what is God's purpose in times of suffering? Suffering is for God's glory. We cannot neglect to say this. In all these purposes that God has in suffering, we need to see that one purpose is happening. The ultimate purpose is that God is glorified. As we saw earlier, that man in John chapter 9 who was blind, that happened in his life, it said, so that God would be glorified, so that God, God's works would be made known. 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 to 7 shows how trials come in our lives to bring about praise, glory, and honor to God. And Romans 11 verse 36 says, From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Well, this is God's message to us. As this virus happens, as we face other forms of suffering in our life, remember that God is doing something. He is working in all of this. He has plans and purposes. And may we see them and be used to bring them about. Find comfort in in knowing these big purposes of God and what he is doing. And don't get bogged down with the unending questions of why. Though we will, we will at times wonder, come back and remember these purposes. We may not understand every detail. We may not understand what God is doing, but we can trust him. Romans 11, verse 33 and 36 say these words, and they need to be remembered by us in these seasons of suffering. They say, oh, the depth of of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Don't forget God and who he is, and what he is doing in the season of suffering. And don't waste those seasons. They are precious times in our lives. Strive to see how these good purposes of God in suffering can be achieved in your life today and in the days to come. Let's pray. Our loving and good Father, we pray that you would teach us your ways, that you would teach us to rely upon you, that you would show us your purposes in all that you are doing, and in particular, in this area of suffering. Show us what you are doing, God. Show us how you want us to live in this time, as we suffer, as we face difficulty, in all times of life, God. Show us what you want us to do. And may you bring about these purposes, God, in our lives for your glory alone. Amen. To close, I want to read some lyrics from two songs, and I encourage you to go and listen to them as we don't have a time of singing together. The first song I want to read from is How Firm a Foundation. Two verses I'll read. It says, When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you, your troubles to bless, and sanctify to you your deepest distress. When through fiery trials your pathways shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt you, I only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine. And another song, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Two verses say this, No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future, sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised 
to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Friends, do not lose heart. Do not let your hearts be troubled, but trust in God in this time.